Well, <clears throat> the war started, I guess, in September of 1939. And, of course, there was always a lot of talk of who's going, who's not going. Everybody was going to go. Nobody was going to go. And by July 15th of 1940, I had made up my mind to go. Well, we went, previous to that, we went to Woodstock. They weren't enlisting because they weren't ready yet. We went to Fredericton. They weren't enlisting because they weren't ready yet. The war kind of caught them off guard. And we went to St. John, and the only uh, place you could get in was the St. John Fusiliers. And that's what I joined in, 19, in 1940, July 15th. Well, we <laughs> first two weeks there, warm, no nothing. I worked in the kitchen washing dishes because they had so many people there and they weren't ready for them. They had to set the regiment down in two sittings and uh, scrub up the dishes and set them down again for to finish up the other half. And that's where I was for two weeks washing dishes. Well, one day during that time, I got a letter from home and uh, kind of anxious to read it so I wiped off my hands started to read the letter and Hordley Corporal come along and said okay you back in the suds oh I paid no attention much to him I just went on reading the letter and he come over and snapped the letter right out of my hand and says get down in the suds I told you <laughs> I snapped him right back and snapped the letter right back and I hit him right on the jaw and he went right over the table and broke dishes and uh, of course naturally I was charged with and taken up in the next morning in front of the company commander and I still didn't have a uniform and uh, he read the charge and uh, that I had struck a superior officer and guilty or not guilty. And I said, well, I guess I hit him all right. And he said, now I'm going to tell you what could happen to you. He said, you could uh, be given so many days confined to barracks. You could be given so many days detention. Or you could be stood in front of a firing squad and shot. <laughs> I said, oh my God, I've only been here a week, two weeks, and they're going to shoot me already. So but anyway, that passed, and uh, I joined the signals platoon of the company, and that was where you learned to do Morse code and all that sort of thing. And uh, while attending a switchboard one time, a paymaster come along, saw me trying to type on the typewriter, and the next morning I got word to report to him in the pay office. And you know, they don't ask you if you can do anything, they just tell you to do it. So I went to work in the pay office. And that time they had great big pay sheets and addition and all that sort of thing. You column after column of addition. No, we didn't have any of those little things you punch. Well, <laughs> so I worked there quite a while, but I had my weekends off and I had to do no guard duties or no pickets or no fatigues or anything. I just go to work in the morning, work till evening, and that was it. It was beautiful. And when we was out west, why Phyllis was there with us, and I could go out every night. We had every weekend off. How'd you get out west? Well, they uh, were going... At that time, the Japanese had uh, landed on the Aleutian Islands, just off Alaska. And they sent our regiment, along with one or two others, to go out and chase them off, I guess. But uh, we got to Vancouver. They uh, sent one company over, and they they found that the Japanese had uh, had left it anyway. So there was no con no connection there at all, no war there or whatever. But they had left it, and uh, the Americans left all their equipment that they had right there too. Oh, there was quite an invasion there to get the Japanese off the Aleutians. Our island was Kiska, but there was nothing there. But anyway, still worked in the pay office, and and uh, the guys were, this was long about, what, 1943, somewhere there. 
and uh, everybody was getting anxious to get overseas. They're going to miss the war and all this sort of thing. And some of them joined the paratroopers, and some joined the artillery. And but the regiment didn't go over as a as a as a regiment because it was a machine gun regiment, and uh, the Vickers machine gun regiment. And the First World War, they were the big thing. Second World War, they were obsolete. They weren't, you know, they weren't. Uh, they didn't fight the war in a fixed position. They kept small sections, and they were quite mobile and moved around. And the Vickers was a pretty permanent fixture, so they didn't use that gun much. It was water-cooled, and it took uh, two or three men to handle it, and four or five to lug ammunition. So it was actually no good. But anyway, we uh, decided among some of us that we'd go overseas. And we got, finally got uh, permission, and we went to Aldershot camp, trained there a little while. And of course, Phyllis followed us around wherever we went, she went. And it was no trouble for us to get a job, get a place to live, because uh, the, they had no children. The people didn't like to have kids coming in, most of them. And uh, we could go in and no children, why, great and good. So uh, eventually I went overseas and landed in Greenwich, Scotland. And uh, the Scotch people, oh, they were, they used you awfully well. Every place you went, they had donuts and coffee and tea and whatnot. And we went down to England, <laughs> everything stopped. I uh, didn't have that much training with uh, the infantry regiments or anything like that. And uh, what training we had, we got in England while we were there. And one of the parts of it was with the Bren gun. And that's a gun that had a tripod in the front, and it uh, a magazine that you wrapped into the top had about 30, 40 rounds in it. And uh, I did pretty well with that. So when we, that was, that leads up to something later on. But uh, we only were only in England a little while, and the Mad Major come. They called him a Mad Major. And he got everybody to sit down on the ground and make sure their boots were all hobnailed. And all of a sudden, he said, you know, we need you over there awful bad because they're dropping like flies. And <laughs> we need reinforcements real bad. Well, that didn't make everybody feel too good. But uh, eventually, well, about two weeks we were there. We went o left and went overseas. And I was on a little ship, didn't seem to be very big. But the crossing of the English Channel, they said, was always rough and it would be real bad. But I wasn't a bit sick coming over on the on the big boats across, and going across the English Channel, it was just as smooth as glass. There wasn't a ripple in the water, and a big moonlight night, full moon, and we were cramped down in the hold of that little ship and stinking and sweating, and so when nobody was looking, I sneaked up on deck and hid under the stairway. And oh, it was beautiful out there, just watching the things go by. But when we land in Greenwich, why, like I said, the Scotch people used us real good, <coughs> and the English didn't. They 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 were fed up with so many troops because the Canadian troops had been there ever since the first of the war. A lot of them, and they were getting quite fed up with them actually. But again, we when we got in France, why? things started to uh, <laughs> stir up a little bit. And uh, Falais Gap was where, let's see, was it Falais or, yeah, it was Falais, I think, where I first met. I was appointed or given to the Winnipeg Rifles at Falais Gap and Can, C-A-A-N-E or something. And uh, very shortly after that, we went to the Leopold Canal in Belgium, and that was a canal oh, about 30 feet wide water, humps on both sides because uh, where they dug it up and throw in the dirt on each side of it. And we were on one side and they gave the order to go across and everybody jumped and grabbed something and waded and swam and floated and got across to the other side and dug in on the shelf of the other side. 
And uh, there was 85, I think, in the company when we started over. And when we got there, they claimed there was 35, of course. It always seemed like you was all alone, mostly. You know, you never hardly knew there was anybody else there with you. Uh, we were, I was dug, do dug down into a little slit trench with another chap. And, of course, we had a brand gun. <laughs> and right down about 100, 200 yards down across the field, there was a stone fence with a gate. And it was just, oh, almost dark. And they would send up the flares, you know, they called it artificial moonlight. And uh, every once in a while, you'd see somebody dash across the mouth of that gate from one side to the other. So I lined the Bren gun up, gun up on the hole and, and uh, get where the gate was. As soon as somebody went, I pulled the trigger. I don't know whether it hit anybody or not. I imagine it scared them. <laughs> but uh, very shortly after, the a lieutenant dropped into our trench. And, Who fired that, uh, that gun? And of course, I was going to get a medal, so I said, I did. And then he gave me a big blast for firing the gun because what it did, it gave away our position and uh, that we had crossed the canal and set up on the other side. Even though there was a lot of action going on at the time, they didn't know we'd gotten across. But then the shells started coming in, uh, mortar shells. And uh, I kind of felt responsible in a way for that. But uh, we, we were there two or three, four days, I guess. And they would shell, every once in a while they'd send in a few shells. And I was sitting down in the slit trench. The fellow that I was with saw a body coming down the, floating down the canal, and he went out to, it was a German body, and he went out to loot it. He was going to get his watch and what money he had, and got a pole and was pulling him in. And I was sitting down inside the slit trench, and it, again, it was at night. You didn't move around much only at night. And the, uh, there was enough light, they called it artificial moonlight, the flares, to s see a little bit. And uh, I was sitting there, and they started shelling again. And I heard one come quite handy. And it zoomed in and hit and went bang. And it was a great flash of light. And I threw my arms over my head and ducked down. And when I uh, opened up my arms and my eyes, I didn't have any legs. And uh, <laughs> I thought I'd been hit and tore my legs off. And it scared me. And I hollered, stretch your bear, just as hard as I could holler. And uh, they come a running, crawling over there, shells still dropping. And uh, dropped down into the slit trench where I was. Said, what's the matter? And by that time, I started to work my legs and my feet. And the side of the trench had caved in and covered my legs up. And when I didn't see them, I thought they were gone, but they were just covered up. And I said to the guy, I guess I don't need you really. And then he gave me a big blast, crawling all around. And one other really nauseating thing that happened, <coughs> Shortly after that, we, they had been uh, little parties sent out to clean houses and this sort of thing. And uh, a bunch of us went out to gather up some of the wounded and some of the, some of the ones that were, well, dead, I guess. And long before, there'd been battles there, too. And we were crawling along, ducking down. And, and uh, I jumped over a, a bunch of bushes and landed right stuck my hand right into the, almost into the body of a dead German. It had been all deteriorated. And oh, it was an awful stink. Of course, that smell was there all the time. There was a horrible smell right over the thing all the time. And uh, it wasn't very pleasant, but after a while, I got word to uh, one of the companies got a direct hit on their headquarters. And it killed their commander and their their company clerk and their CSM and the whole works, and they wiped out the whole thing, blew up everything that was there. And I got word to go to the to that particular company because I had been doing clerical work in Canada. They got me to go over and 
find out who was all in the company, get a list of uh, what they called a roll call, or the nominal roll, I guess was the term they used, and uh, of everybody in the company, and the attached personnel and this sort of thing. Well, that was a pretty big job because I didn't know anybody. I had no idea who was what, and uh, I had to go around visiting all the different places and finding the the officers of the regiment, and they would let me know where their sections were and their companies were, or the uh, platoons were, who was in charge of them. And eventually I got the nominal role rigged up, and they, starting with the officer commanding and the captains, the lieutenants, the sergeant, sergeant major, and on down. And, uh, and then I worked at that for the time being. Uh, radar in uh, in MASH was the job that I was doing, more or less, and pretty pretty accurate too in a lot of ways, because they they put a quite a lot of uh, of uh, responsibility on that part of the uh, company too. Now, for instance, uh, somebody gets killed, you have to gather up all his belongings, all of his personal effects, and this sort of thing, and. Uh, get them ready to mail home and write a letter of condolence, so to speak. They used to have just a form letter. We regret to inform you that your son has been killed, had been uh, instantly killed during uh, a certain portion of the fighting and uh, we know that there's nothing we can do to alleviate your sorrow and we're sorry, but he was a good soldier, but nothing to worry about. He, everything's all fine now. He was in dead. So, uh, but it sounded awful cold, no good, but what I used to do, I used to write a real a personal letter to them and try to get a picture of the place where his body was, was they do bury him in a lot of cases, I've been on two or three burial parties, and uh, get a picture of the place where he was buried at that particular moment, and uh, if possible, and all of the pertinent information whether if he was wounded and taken to the hospital and died in the hospital, that was said. No, not that he was killed instantly or anything like that, but it was pretty accurate. And I got different letters back. They were addressed to the company commander, of course, uh, answers back from the people that got the letters appreciating what was done for them. But Where was this now? That was in, Fran in Belgium. See, we went from France to Belgium, and the Leopold Canal was in Belgium. And from there on, we went across the border into Germany, into Lier and e or, uh, different cities in Germany. And they were, they were literally blasted all to pieces. Lier, for instance, <laughs> there was only one side of one building standing, and that had a window in it a lot of little windows, and they were all the little windows were broken out except one. And uh, a fellow named Stevie drove a truck that I had my equipment in, and uh, I asked him if he'd stop the truck just a minute, and he stopped, and I got a rock, and I threw it through the one last window. <laughs> I broke the last window in Lear. But anyway, and another time we... Well, actually, I'll, I'll explain the truck a little bit. That held all of the company uh, stores and the uh, office equipment. And when you would advance a certain part of the uh, area, you'd find a, an old hen house or an old building or some sort of a place to set up shop and uh, to uh, do the necessary work that is involved in, in the uh, administration of the company. And I, uh, keeping the nominal roll up to date and the, and the, the uh, track, the, keep track of the wounded and who was out and who was coming in, uh, all this sort of thing. Everything, there's a lot of things. Of course, there was a lot of promotions <coughs> and then too because a lot of the chaps would get, get uh, knocked off and somebody had to replace them. So there was the promotions and, the, and there was the odd uh, fine and all these things had to be taken into consideration. And the company clerk to the front, the, uh, a, they called it A echelon. There's an A echelon and a B echelon way back where the, the, uh, 
battalion commanders and all those people are. And then there's A Echelon is up where the company commander is and uh, the administrative staff there, which it was me. And uh, then the uh, front line, it wasn't a line actually, just uh, we were about a mile from the front, the furthest front position. And sometimes we were less than, much less than a mile. And uh, we didn't really have to worry too much about attack at that time because uh, the Germans were on, in those days, the Germans were on the retreat. But uh, we did have to fret over the shelling. The shelling was pretty heavy sometimes coming in. But uh, and then occasionally I had to go to the front with the mail. They call it the front. It's it's a it's a kind of a mobile thing. Maybe one day they'd be one place, next day they'd be somewhere else. So it wasn't a fixed line like it was in the war, First World War. The big long lines of trenches. They didn't have those. They just wherever you settled down, you dug a little hole and and uh, made it from there. And about twice a twice a week or three times a week, I would. Uh, go with the with the jeep to the front with the mail with the parcels maybe sometimes and uh, bring back uh, sometimes bring back uh, a wounded or two maybe bring back uh, a German prisoner or two <laughs> and uh, but there was a different size trucks well there's a there's a size of fifteen hundred weight to call that 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 we used to carry our was like well that would be similar to a two ton truck and then there was a truck similar to a one-ton truck. It was smaller, they're covered. And uh, I went up one time with the mail and left the mail and they had four or five prisoners there to come back. So I bounced them into the back of the truck and the driver of the truck is in front and I got in back with the prisoners and to see that they stayed there. And uh, here I was with six or five or six Germans. They, of course, they weren't armed naturally, I was but uh, sidearms, but I took out a pack of cigarettes and lit one, and they were kind of looking at me kind of funny, so I gave me gave each a cigarette. And uh, we all lit up and were smoking, and they all felt pretty good, and they were talking, jabbering away, and we got back to the A echelon, and our sergeant major was there waiting for them, and he always used to take them back. He'd ride the motorcycle, and they'd walk. And uh, they'd come piling out of the truck, and they, of course, the smoke and the cigarettes. And he gave me quite a blast for giving the guy cigarettes. He didn't like Germans very much. And uh, he didn't think it was a very good thing to do. <laughs> he gave me quite a going over for giving them cigarettes. But... Uh, it was it was an interesting experience. Uh, there was one time we were uh, having we had our meals outside, and uh, they, they set up the field kitchen, and uh, where we were only a mile from where the troops were, uh, every once in a while, that well, it'd be one section would. Uh, be brought back for food, and they would go back, and another section come back. It's quite a job to keep troops fed. And uh, there was one morning I was got up. They had the kitchen all set up, and I got up, was going over to get my breakfast, and there was a dugout there in the ground, and uh, pulled over. It was, they had the top of it all pulled over, and. Uh, it was manned, or this area was manned by the people with the anti-aircraft guns, but they were using them as tank weapon. And uh, they had advanced so far, and they were having to sleep in this hole in the ground with the logs over the top and a few, oh, a little bit of straw and whatnot on top of the logs. Well, when I come along, I walked right across the top of the top of the logs, right over toward our kitchen, and this boy voice from down inside hollered, get the hell off of there. And uh, I hollered back something at him, and he, he came right back up out of there fighting mad. 
and here with Percy Ritchie down the road here, just a little ways. And he was the only one that I ever saw over there. And uh, it was quite a, quite a, an experience. And uh, things like that, but, well, I never, we, I had a lot of good friends there that got hit, hurt. And then there was one fellow, Sergeant, uh, mm, Bercy, Sergeant Bercy, I think it was. He had landed in D-Day with the regiment. And he had gone through the whole business. Never had a wound, never got a scratch. And uh, just, oh, about three months, three weeks before the war ended, that would be in April sometime, he was up overhead in the hen bin looking for eggs, and he fell down through and broke both legs. <laughs> oh, he was mad. He went through all that whole war, and he never got a scratch, and he just looking for eggs, and he broke both legs. But uh, then we were set up right in Germany, uh, near a little town. I don't think can't think of the name of it now, but it was in the country. And I had uh, I had a little radio with with me. I picked up, and the truck was set up right behind. Uh, a bunch of buildings, and I was listening to the radio, and it was the 8th of May, 7th of May, in the evening, and they got word that ceasefire would be given at 8 o'clock the next morning, on the 8th of May. And, uh, of course, I typed it all off on typewriter and pasted it up on the side of the truck, hollered to everybody to come and read it, and they were having a quite a time around there. There was one lieutenant, lieutenant, they call him here, he had a, had orders to clear a house that was down, oh, probably 500 yards from where we were. It was supposed to have been occupied by Germans. And uh, he got his section together, and part of his platoon, and uh, was going to go clear that house. Well. It seemed stupid. Uh, the ceasefire was going to be 8 o'clock the next morning. Why was he so worried about that house? But uh, they argued about it a little bit, but he went anyway. And he lost two men on that. And it, it was unnecessary. Of course, it was a lot of them was unnecessary. But we were pretty happy. Well, we went back to uh, to Belgium and waited there for repatriation home. And uh, was there quite a little while, then moved on over to England. And uh, with a few delays, and because I'd had quite a lot of a time, I mean, not particularly the overseas, but a lot of time uh, accumulated during the war, I was up pretty high on the repatriation list. And I got back, and when I come back, they had me slated to go, go to Winnipeg. And uh, I didn't say a word. I waited until I got on the boat, and we got off the shore and got going. And then I made my complaints that it was kind of stupid to send me clear to Winnipeg, and I'd come back come back to St. John. So the boat docked at St. was supposed to dock at St. John. And... Uh, well, finally, they they let they gave me permission to get off the boat at, or to go to St. John, and I would come up to Number Seven Depot in Fredericton, and was discharged from there. And they wanted me to stay in and work in Fredericton in the in the office down there, and uh, I could almost had anything I asked for then, but <laughs> I didn't want any more of it. Perhaps I should have. But that was about the uh, oh, some of the highlights. Of course, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of things left out that take days to say everything.